Tom, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to interview you again. Can you tell your readers and listeners about the steps we as human beings go through to lower our entropy? Well, yes. I think you're referring to uh, some some words that I said in uh, in Ireland last time I was there. Yes. And uh, basically what I did is, is kind of looked at the fractal process of us evolving. And we see some of the uh, some of the steps. Now let's start with a with a with a uh, just inside of this virtual reality PMR. Okay, we're going to start with our physical virtual reality. And besides that, we're going to start on Earth with biology. And then we're going to expand out from there. So it's going to be kind of a PMR centric viewpoint. Yeah, you start with the first cell. Okay, now it uh, divided, we know, and created a lot of one celled little uh, you know, cells. So there's a lot of individual cells created from this, this one initial cell. Now the first step in lowering entropy was for those individual cells to learn how to cooperate, to learn how to work together, to learn how to group up in a very low entropy fashion, in a low entropy configuration. And when they did that, when they were able to work together, they became one. So a bunch of individual cells become one. And what, what was the one thing they became? Well, a multi-celled creature. They produced a multi-celled creature. And it was through the cooperation and um, uh, working together, I guess, in, in a selfless way. None of the cells could, uh, you know, claim ownership of the whole. They were all just part of the whole. And together they were one whole thing that was bigger than they were. And that's a multi-celled creature. Okay, so then we had lots of multi-celled creatures. And the reason we had lots of them is because by working together, they lowered their entropy. They were more effective and they could better procreate and better survive, which are the two criteria in a biological system. So here they are. Uh, an improved, an improved thing, if you will, an improved entity from a whole bunch of individual cells. Now a bunch of cells working together with lower entropy because of all the structure they have and cooperation. The next step up is a bunch of these multi-celled things got together and cooperated and became yet a bigger thing. Now they were one with something bigger. That something bigger was a thing that had differentiated cells. And what that means, cell differentiation means that you have some cells that are the controlling part, some cells that are the food gathering part, some cells that are di the digestion, some cells that are the locomotion, some cells that are the defense. So they specialized. Each of the cell groups in these multi-celled things specialized to do something very, very well but they didn't have to do everything. So they grouped together with other cells in this kind of mutual uh, pact, if you will, that created a, a differentiated multi-celled thing. And they were more successful. And again, they had to do this, not with each one of them uh, demanding their, you know, uh, demanding recognition for their, for their services, but as a whole thing. They did it through cooperation, through... Uh, getting along through working together, not through um, ego or it's all about me. It had to be all about the one thing that we formed together. So that would be like the next big stage in evolution. Okay, now we're part of that group. You know, so is a jellyfish, you know, so is a, so is a, 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 you know, a tiger or, or any other critter, an insect. They're all part of that that group where you have millions, if not billions of cells, and they're all differentiated in the sense that they have all, all the groupings of cells have different specialties, things that they do to service the whole, but it's all one thing. You know, you take a frog, it's all one thing, but there's eyes, there's the tongue, you know, there's the, there's the web feet, you know, there's the heart, 
there's the intestines, there's all these different parts of the frog that all cooperate. And same with the human being. Now let's move it up to the next level. We see how we're, we're, we're repeating the same fractal process is repeating at higher levels of, of uh, cooperation. The next thing then, since we belong to that last level, we're one of those entities that are full of cooperating specialized cells. You know, our heart, liver, tongue, teeth, everything are specialized cells all cooperating together. And again, this is an egoless um, cooperation. We can't have a, a, an egotistical liver saying, I refuse. I'm not going to process any more blood until, you know, uh, I get more credit. It doesn't work like that. If it does, it's called disease. You know, the body wouldn't survive. It wouldn't work. They all have to work together as one thing. So now the next step is that human beings and critters, all the things that are alive and, and sentient on the earth, need to do the same thing. We need all to be able to cooperate, to work together, to care, to become one thing, you see. And that one thing would be humanity or the ecosystem and critters on the earth. Maybe we call that one thing Gaia. That was a, a name, I think, given to the, the earth and all of its environments and critters together being one living thing. So then we all become Gaia, you see, and we all kind of work together and, and uh, cooperate. And we have this one, one thing. Well, now what's the next thing after that? Well, then if we at Earth are Gaia, and that's a living organism all by itself, and we're pieces, specialized pieces within it, we're the human specialized part, you see, then the next step would be that we, along with other Gaias that we find where? In the Milky Way, in other parts of our universe, that we all learn to cooperate with each other. And see, all this cooperation is first letting go of fear, letting go of ego, even at the level of those first cells. Those first cells are out there surviving on their own. Well, another cell represented a threat as well as an opportunity, but they had to learn to let go of that fear and, uh, and, and be cooperative. Well, that meant that they generated themselves, the one-celled thing generated into multi-cells, you see. So it wasn't that uh, the change, doing something new was fearful. You go ahead and try that and it works. Now, I'm not saying that individual cells had consciousness and they did this on purpose. It's not like that. This is all just evolution. And it wasn't so much that groups of multi-cells got together and decided on a plan because that's not the way it works at that level. It's just that evolution turned out that more complex things with differentiated uh, jobs where the cells specialized turned out to be more survivable, lower entropy. But you see, eventually you end up with critters. You end up with, uh, with mammals and people, and you end up with you know, frogs and, and, and lizards and fish and all sorts of things. And these things are sentient. So now they get to be able to affect their own evolution because of their awareness. You see, awareness now starts to come into this picture. So whether or not they group up isn't a matter of just evolution trying different configurations of, of uh, all the living things on the planet Earth until it finally finds one that works. Because that no longer works when you have a bunch of independently sentient creatures. Now, once, once consciousness comes into it, now it has to be intentional grouping up. Now the cells, the pieces given a cell, let's say humans are a cell in Gaia. Now you have to have intentional coming together, intentional cooperation, because we've raised up to that level where we have consciousness. And at that level, there's so many more different kinds of configurations that you can't just wait for the random one to produce something better. We have to do it. Okay, so then we see our, our purpose is to group together with all the other beings and things that are sentient. And it's not just people. It's all the critters as well. We need to live on earth 
in harmony with everything that's there, doing our specialized role. We'll be a specialized set of critters, if you will, doing our role. Well, we have probably the, lo the, the most complex consciousness of, of the critters. Well, you know, uh, dolphins and, uh, and whales may be an exception. They have more brain power, perhaps, than we have. They have larger brains, at least. So we may not be the, the largest consciousness, but we are uh, among the larger consciousness critters. So it's, you know, we have kind of a special responsibility to live not only peacefully, but harmoniously in Earth, a single big ecosystem in which we all belong and get along and take responsibility for each other. And we don't see ourselves as the separate part that's important, but just another part of one bigger thing, thing bigger than us. So now <clears throat> we have to look out into the Milky Way, perhaps, in our galaxy, and find all the other Earths that are out there. And rather than approach them with fear, one day it may all have to grow to where all the living entities, all the Gaia-like creations in the galaxy, cooperate, become one, something bigger, like a galactic Gaia, if you will. And then, what happens then? Well, there may be such Gaias or galactic Gaias in other galaxies spread all over the universe. And then it has to happen again. If we get to the point where the universe is just one big cooperative thing, the whole universe and all the sentient life in it is one big cooperative living thing, then we spread out to other universes. Well, how do we do that? Other universes. Now we have a, a, conscious, a consciousness developed to the point that we are mind more than we are physical bodies. Those other consciousnesses in other, in other universes are in NPMR, what's non-physical to us. And by that time, we're completely aware of physical reality being a virtual reality, and that consciousness is the fundamental thing. And now we have to cooperate and become one with all the other universes. And you see what happens is eventually all of it becomes one with the larger consciousness system. So see, you can see this progression of cells, individual cells, just being driven by randomness, by, uh, you know, by chance into developing more complex systems, because at that level, the number of choices they had was very, very limited. Randomness and chance had a pretty good chance of producing a better product. So over millions of years, they did develop this. But once you get to the sentient beings, the dogs, the cats, you know, the fish and the lizards and the frogs, all the sentient things and the bumblebees too. Now you have something that can't just come together and develop something bigger than itself without their cooperation, without their intended cooperation, because now intent becomes the motive force, not randomness. And you see how this, this thing just keeps wrapping up one level at a time, at a time, at a time. And you also see that by the time you're done, it all wraps up into one thing, consciousness the larger consciousness system, and we all become one with that. So that kind of gives us a neat little metaphor, and all of this is a metaphor, you know, there, there's, no, there's no guarantee that all of that sort of thing even can happen. But it's a nice little metaphor, how we see how it has happened in the past, and kind of where we need to go, that the next step is for human beings to become good oh, I don't know, good caretakers, if you will, good citizens of a larger reality called Earth. That's where we need to go. So it's, it's an interesting uh, fractal process. You see, the fractal keeps spreading out and getting bigger and more, more uh, um, complex, but more structured and more structured. And the entropy gets getting lower and lower, and it gets bigger and bigger. This is a fractal process. And the process, of course, is the process of evolution. 
So if you want to see kind of where we are in this process and what our job is now, well, this job is to come together in a cooperative union that optimizes it for everybody. Now, there's a few details there. One is that some people will think that when you come together in an optimizing process, you know, what is that? Well, at the level of individual cells, that's just cells, you know, multi-celled things learning that they're more survivable. But at our level, that's love. That's what it means when you come together in a cooperative way to form something bigger than yourself. That's love. That's what two people do when they actually fall in love. The two people come together in a loving relationship and they form something that's bigger than either one of them. You see, they become a one thing. Well, we can do this not just with two people. We needed to do this with all seven billion of us, you see, plus all the dogs and cats and frogs and everything else, plus the rivers and the oceans and all of that, because we depend on all of that. The living things depend on the non-living things. You see, the, the plants depend on the minerals in the soil. So it's all an interdependent thing. And we, at the level of of aware consciousness have to do this by becoming love, interacting with each other with love. So that's kind of how our evolution from a kind of this virtual reality, you can see how in this virtual reality, in this, in this universe, how that principle kind of will keep cycling and cycling for us to uh, grow. And where it all ends in the end is one with the larger consciousness system. So I thought that was just an interesting metaphor and it, it kind is. of gives us our, our kind of our place in the chain. You know, what are we doing now? Well, we're here to take the next however long it takes before humans, all the critters in the earth kind of become one. What that means is not that they become slaves to one thing. It's that they become one cooperative, optimized whole. You see, it's one optimized group. And... That's what we're talking about. Now, some people have this idea that if you, if you end up in this collective whole, you know, collective kind of sounds like socialism. Collective sounds like, um, you know, a communal existence. And, oh, no, that's bad. You know, that's no freedom there. You need freedom to be the rugged individual that can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Well, the rugged individual that can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, is a fear-based construct. And the only reason that looks like freedom is because we are fear-based. Once you get over that, you realize that when you come together in, in love and in caring and in a cooperative way, your freedom actually is greater. You get more freedom. There's no tyranny of the majority. It's not like that. That's only like that if a whole bunch of people who are fear-based get together. You get a bunch of fear-based and belief-based people together, and yes, it turns into tyranny of the majority. Freedom is lost there. But if you get a bunch of love-based people together, there is no tyranny of the majority. There's more freedom. Uh, this just happens naturally. For an example, um, over the last, what, 2,000 years, what we've seen is a migration from the countryside to the city. Okay, why is that? Well, it's the same process. People are coming together in cities where there's more structure, where there's more, um, you know, more things are defined, more structure, more, well, they would think like more opportunity, more opportunity to get into a structure, to get a job, to, uh, you know, interact in ways that, that are profitable to them. Now, why is it that they keep doing it? This, this uh, migration from the countryside to the cities, why does that keep going? Like I say, for 2,000 years, that's been a fact of life. And it's even more so today. The big part of our Earth's population lives in urban areas. Matter of fact, an awful lot of our planet is just one big urban area, even if that takes in Several cities and maybe hundreds of smaller cities all get kind of swallowed up into one urban area. That urban area may be separated by 10 or 20 or 50, 100 miles here and there of 
land that isn't that isn't occupied or isn't occupied but sparsely but still you know the communications that we have as we all pull together we are developing this uh um i don't know you might say even uh, you know planet earth becomes like city earth you know we're all kind of not so separate as we used to be you know we in the u.s and new york and l.a and tokyo and london you know and and that we're all kind of together in a lot of things and our economies affect each other and you know the movies that we make in hollywood are shown in japan and the cars they make in japan are driven in the u.s and so <coughs> you know so on all over and the internet has connected us very much and that's all just going to grow so this idea of coming together the people came to the cities to improve their lives if their lives would have been better where they were they would have stayed there or they would have gone back to the countryside but there was more opportunity in the city and one might say yeah but there was less freedom now they couldn't just get up whenever they wanted to they had to get up in time to get to work on time they had to work a nine to five and they had to do this and that. But guess what? When they were out there on the land, they worked uh, dawn till dusk. They worked more. They worked harder and ended up with less because in the city, it was cooperative. Two or 300 people working in a big factory or a big concern could produce products that then could give all of them enough money to live much better than they could live when they were trying to eke out a living on the land. So when you do have this coming together to cooperate and a factory or a corporation or a country really is people agreeing to cooperate rather than just, you know, people all individual out on their own for themselves. It's a cooperative adventure. You know, a country is, a factory is, it's a whole bunch of people cooperating to produce something that none of them could, could produce individually. And it finds out that they all end up with more freedom. They all end up with a better situation and a better life. Okay, there are constraints. They do have to go to work on time. Maybe put in there eight hours a day or do whatever that is. But that buys them a lot more freedom. They can take that eight hours a day and now they can get in a jet and go fly anywhere they want in the world and have a vacation or see this or see that or do different things. They can have a computer and get around on the internet. They couldn't do any of that when they were just living on the land, you see, trying to eke out a, a uh, you know, hand-to-mouth existence, working very, very hard and wondering whether they'd starve the next winter if the crop didn't come in, you know, before. So they got more freedom, freedom to fly, freedom to travel, freedom to have leisure time, you know, lots of things that people didn't have when it was just a agrarian individual, rugged individualist out there on the land trying to keep himself and his family from starving to death. And that's the way it always works. So when you have these, these groupings, when they come together with a common purpose, then you end up with more freedom, not less. And if that common purpose is love-based, you end up with maximum freedom possible. You are still the master of your own decisions within your own decision space. As big as your reality is, as big as your decision space is, you still are the individual. You're the rugged individualist. You're the master of making those choices. Nobody can force you to do anything. You do what you do because that's what you decide to do. And that stays with you always. So this idea that if you are part of a larger collection of things, like the cells in our body are a collection of a larger thing, you know, us, a human being, is a collection of billions of cells. It's not that these cells all lose freedom and that they are somehow subjugated by the needs and wills of the body. These cells have as much, if not more, freedom to do what they do. They've specialized. So there are cells that all they do is attach oxygen to hemoglobin and run it through the body, you know, their blood cells. And that's all they do. They circulate and grab oxygen and carry it around to the cells. That's what they do. 
If they didn't do that, what would they rather do? Say, okay, hemoglobin, take a vacation. What do you want to do? Well, you know, they do what they, they do what they do, and that is their, their world. They don't feel like uh, that uh, the rest of the body has a whip making them pick up oxygen, and then they resent it. There is no ego. You see, there are no beliefs in ego and fear there. It's just cooperative. So when you speak of cooperative, you're speaking of this in a positive sense. So the question would be, what do we need to, to do? Where can we start to become one with the earth? Because these collective cooperative beings need to be more positive in the things they produce, the ideas they produce, and the uh, ways they organize things. You, yeah. in, in your book, I just wanted to note that fractals are not a new thing, but in your book you, ha you coined a unique way of describing fractals that apply to consciousness, a consciousness evolution pro right. process. Right, it's called a process right. fractal. Process fractal. Yeah. You know, we have geometric fractals, which are little geometric shapes or curves, like a triangle is a geometric shape. And then you make a fractal by, I'll say we, have a, we start with a triangle, and on this edge of this triangle, we'll put a whole bunch of smaller triangles. And on each edge of those triangles, we'll put a whole bunch of smaller triangles. And what happens if you keep building this pattern up by different levels of recursively applying triangles to triangles, you end up with a very big, complex, amazing geometrical pattern, you know? And matter of fact, we find that these geometric fractals look like natural world. They look like clouds and mountains and rocks and woods and streams. And they kind of have this, and they, they so much resemble our natural world that that is the way most of the animation is done these days. Rather than before, you had an artist sitting down drawing a picture of a mountain or a lake, and then you draw it with the light a little differently, and you draw it with the light a little differently, and you draw you know, a zillion pictures, each a little different from the other, and then you skim through the pictures one after another, and you have an animation. Now, much of these scenes, the woods and the mountains and the, and the natural things, are just dumped out of a computer from fractal mathematics, you see, because they, they represent the natural world. So they're not artists now drawing pictures of the mountains and drawing pictures of, of the trees and the woods and the scenery. A lot of that's just fractal math. And the reason that fractals, geometric fractals, represent our world is that we live in a geometric reality. We live in a 3D geometric reality. It's a virtual reality that's created based on giving it dimensions, three dimensions, defining space. What's space? Well, it's defined when you define the reality. You know, space is distance, you know, it's geometry. So we have this uh, process fractal that generates a virtual reality, which is a 3D fractal. One would expect that fractals, ge geometric fractals, would then look like our geometric fractal that we live in. You see, our virtual reality is a fractal-based thing. So geometric fractals look like it. Not that surprising. But a, a process fractal is a different thing. Now you take a process, and a process does something. It starts with an input, you know, does something, and ends with an output. That's a process. Well, now you take this input, you do the process, you get an output. Then you apply that same process on that output. See, the output then becomes the input. So then it goes through the same process and you get a different output. And then you, reply, you apply that same process to that output. And that output becomes the input. It goes through the process and you get a different output. That's the kind of fractal we have. That's a process fractal rather than a geometric fractal. You're not sticking triangle on triangle on triangle. You're sticking process on process on process. It's the same process, just like they're all the same, you know, they're all triangles. It's all the same process, but each output of the last process becomes the input for the next process. Well, what's the process? Evolution. You see, that's how evolution works. It starts with something. It evolves to something else because of this process of evolution. Well, you take that, 
and it evolves to something else, maybe multiple something else's. You see, that's the single cell evolved to the multiple cells, evolved to the differentiated cells, you know, evolved to the losers and the snakes and the people and the monkeys. And then it's all, you know, it, it's just evolution. So you take consciousness. Consciousness is the media. It's the, it's the thing that evolves. It's the, uh, you know, I guess media is the best, the best thing, you know. It's the thing. It's, a, it's this uh, informational system, okay, that uh, has memory, has processing power, is self-changing, and you apply evolution to it. So it's the thing that changes. It's the thing that evolves, where evolution is the process that it undergoes. You take the two of these together and you end up with a consciousness evolution, with a hyphen between those, a consciousness evolution process fractal. And that's what reality is. Reality has all come out of this fractal process of evolution working upon consciousness, consciousness being a digital information system. So that's the kind of the, the big picture. So when I was talking before about this, this process where we have you know, the single cells, the multi cells, the differentiated cells, and then we get things that are aware because now they're complex enough to provide a platform for awareness, for consciousness. Okay, well, consciousness is at a root. You know, the whole virtual reality is a fractal process of consciousness. So you see, that's what you get when you get enough processing power and memory and ability to change yourself together. What happens is, poof, it becomes conscious. You don't build consciousness. You don't design in consciousness. You just give it the environment and the stuff that it needs, and it just happens. So this got complex enough that consciousness just happened. Because that's the way it works. And uh, now this consciousness, it has to group up and cooperate consciously. Not just randomly, but consciously. It has to do this by intention, you see. So here we are. Our job now is to become love, to group up with everything else on this planet and become one conscious whole one thing greater than all of it together. And we just do our part. We're not the master of it. We don't whip the other parts to do what we want them to do. We live in harmony with it. We're just another animal, another species, another product that lives all together on this planet, what we call Gaia. So that's the idea, but we have to do it intentionally. And then the next group up is whether there are other planets like Gaia around that Maybe there are thousands of them. And rather than fight wars with them, we need to eventually become friends with them. We need to eventually join with them and build something bigger yet. And in all of this process, you don't lose freedom. You gain freedom. The individual has more choices, has a bigger decision space, not a smaller one. Just like the people that moved from the country have a bigger decision space. When they lived in the country, they could plant beans or they could plant oats or they could plant potatoes, but they know they were going to spend all day and all, you know, all day digging in the dirt and all night peeling the potatoes, you know, and mending the clothes. And they had a smaller set of choices. They couldn't say, oh, let's take a vacation for a month and go to the Orient. They couldn't do that. They needed to constantly turn that crank to work on that. They had smaller choice set. Now they go to the city, they can work at this factory or that factory. Hey, this one has better benefits. Let's work there. We can do this. We can travel. We have leisure time. We get on the internet. Lots of choices, you see, develop out of this system. If it wasn't for those cities and those people cooperating, there wouldn't be any internet. There wouldn't be any automobiles. There wouldn't be any airplanes. They're all there because people got together and cooperated and worked together. Well, take that to the next level. All this working together creates opportunity, creates more decision space, more freedom. We have more freedom of the things we can do. We have a library at our fingertips now. Just 50 years ago, if you wanted to come up with some sort of fact that you didn't know, it was a jump in the car and drive down to the nearest public library and hope you could find something in hours worth of searching, maybe days or months worth of searching, that gave you what you wanted. 
Now we have access to a million times more information, more flexibility, more decision space, more things to learn, more things to understand. You see, that's more freedom, not less freedom. So that's kind of the way it works. We will gain more freedom. We will gain more satisfaction. Our relationships will be wonderful. We will live in joy and peace and harmony. And it'll be all these things that everybody says, oh, that'll never happen. Hmm. Eventually, it probably will. Now, how long did it take those, those uh, cells you know, to go through their part? And they were doing it just by random mutation. We're doing it by focused intent. Well, it took them millions and millions and millions of years to get together and to cooperate in ways that ended up with human beings. Well, is it going to take us millions and millions of years, you know, warring and killing each other and doing things like that before we end up cooperating? Maybe, maybe even longer. But hopefully with our consciousness and intent, we can do better than that. We don't have to wait for random mutations. We can actually grow up, increase the quality of our consciousness, and move the whole toward that conclusion, toward that kind of blissful end, if you like, which, of course, is not really an end. Like I say, after that, it's, well, how many other guys are there? How many other universes are there? You see, where's the end? The end isn't really until we all become one in the larger consciousness system. But guess what? That's not an end either, because the larger consciousness system is still evolving. It's a changing thing. It's not static. Evolution is open-ended. There is no end to evolution. Have the human beings reached the end of their evolution? Are we always, for the next 20 million years, going to be just like we are now? Probably not. You see, as our environment changes and things change, we will adapt and we will change. We keep evolving. The larger consciousness system is still evolving, still changing, still growing, still becoming. So even when you become one with that, you've become one with a growing, intelligent, living thing. And then are you just nothing? You're no longer an individual? Of course not. You're still an individual and you've got more freedom as an individual, more individual freedom than you ever had before. I hope this evolution as applied to consciousness. Consciousness evolution doesn't take millions and millions of years. I hope so, too. It would be um, nice if it took maybe a few more <laughs> decades. Huh? But, uh, well, this Earth reality has had many wars. We seem to not learn from that. So when you, when you say <clears throat> we will eventually um, discover other universes, are we going to be facing wars there as well? We may have to start that whole cycle all over. If we approach it with fear, you see, but if we learn that lesson here, if we learn that lesson to let go of fear, to be fearless, to be giving, to be love, then why, as a loving part of Gaia, would we want to approach other things with fear? Well, maybe other things hadn't learned that lesson. Maybe they will approach us with fear. Maybe we will have to defend ourselves. Who knows? But it's just another learning process that keeps expanding out with a bigger and bigger ensemble of entities that have to learn to cooperate and get along together. And it always is suboptimal until they learn to live in love. If they, until they do that, as long as we're fear-based, belief-based, ego-based, um, as long as we are driven by those things, then we will always have the wars and the fighting and the fear that uh, will make our lives miserable. We'll see atrocities and terrible things will happen. You know, we will have murder, we will have robbery, we will have abuse, we will have people who have a lot of power abusing people who don't have much. That's just the way of a fear-based society, of a fear-based organization. But that is very suboptimal. That, uh, that basically uh, doesn't go very far. It self-destructs. It'll self-destruct and then something else will grow back up in its place. And if that something else is still fear-based, it will self-destruct and more fear-based stuff will grow back up in its place. And that's why our progress seems to be so slow. 
You see, we get the we get the fascist dictator who's making our lives miserable, and we get rid of him, and we replace him with another fascist dictator that makes our lives miserable, and then we get rid of that one, and then we replace him with another dictator that makes our lives miserable. And we've done this now for hundreds of years. We go from king to king to king, and then maybe a queen, and then a prince, and then another king, and then so on, you see. We can go... And it doesn't have to be just individuals, you know, uh, committees and groups can be tyrants as well. You know, so we go to organizations that are fear-based. It doesn't have to be just a fear-based individual, a king who's the tyrant. It can be a fear-based parliament or a fear-based Congress, a fear-based whatever. It doesn't matter. If our institutions are fear-based, they will self-destruct and something new will will be built on them. And if that is also fear-based, it will self-destruct too, and so on. So this is a very slow process until we, the individuals, grow up and get rid of this fear-based interaction with other people and make it love-based. Then the whole thing will change by itself. I hope it doesn't take tens or thousands of years for scientists and physicists who are interested in consciousness and this connection you've made with it, to begin working together and coming to the conclusions that you have in your My Big Toe. I hope so, too. I hope it doesn't take that long. I see that it's it's coming along quicker than that almost every month. I'll get something uh, in the mail saying, Tom, have you looked at this? And I'll go up and look at it, and it'll be another peer review article penned by some sort of scientists, biologists, physicists, mathematicians, and it will be saying, you know, virtual reality is really a good idea. Virtual reality gives us solutions to these problems. It solves a lot more problems than it creates. We need to take this more seriously. And I see that all the time. So that's gaining credibility. Now, it's been around a long time. You know, we had Fredkin back in the 1980s or maybe the 1990s. I'm not sure where that was. Maybe the 1990s with his papers that basically said, this is a virtual reality. And since then, digital physics has been growing. And since then, the idea of uh, our reality being virtual has very slowly come along. But I see it coming along faster now. Then we went probably from the 1990s, you know, probably a decade before we had the next major, you know, uh, bump along that line. But now these bumps are coming like monthly. We're getting a lot more people realizing that it's, that it's a, a much better, uh, it's much better physics. It's better science. It just works better. It answers more questions. So yes, I hope it doesn't take scientists, you know, thousands of years to uh, give up their positions as, you know, the, the, the priests of our society that they kind of get it. But that's just the next big step. There's a big step after that. First, we have to get the idea, scientists have to get the idea, that this is a virtual reality. Why scientists? Because until the scientists get it, it's not true. Because the scientists are the high priests of Western culture. And until the scientists say, yes, yea, verily, this is a virtual reality, then it isn't. It isn't true, and in general, people in the culture will not believe it. The priests used to tell people what to believe. Now it's the scientists. So it's important that the scientists get to this because they're in charge of telling us what's true and what's not. Now, when they get to it, there's still another couple of paradigms that have to fall. That's just the first paradigm that has to fall. The next understanding is that, you know, Fredkin got to a virtual reality and he said, because a simulation cannot simulate itself, it has to be simulated elsewhere. And he called that other. You know, who's doing this simulation? Where are the programmers, etc.? He said, they're in other. And then he, he uh, did some math that showed some of the characteristics of other. But scientists can just call it other and then go off and, and do the rest of their work. The world in general won't take that answer. Other sounds like not here, sounds like not physical, Sounds like woo-woo, mysticism and religion and a lot of other things. And we will have a lot of pressure to define other. Just leaving it as other as the scientists would do won't work. 
So the next big step will be when other becomes, and when people realize that other is consciousness, that consciousness is the source. Consciousness is other, and that it is a digital information system. Consciousness is a digital information system. And that is what has created this virtual reality, this simulation that we live in. Then there's one more big paradigm after that. Once consciousness is realized to be the computer, the big computer, then the last step that they have to realize is that consciousness is basically social. It's about beings interacting with other beings. And that last paradigm they have to get is that the optimum way for beings to interact is through love. That interacting through fear is very suboptimal. It's destructive. It's a high entropy way of interacting. And that love is a low entropy way of interacting. And that information systems evolve by lowering their entropy. So lower entropy, love, loving interactions, is what the system is all about. That's how the system survives and grows. So when that then being the third big paradigm, then we're there, you see. Then you will have a people who understand what's going on, why they're here, what the point of life is. All of that will fall out, and the answer is love. We're here to grow up and become love. This is a virtual reality. We're part of a large digital information system. And that kind of, you know, that will solve all the rest of the problems. It won't necessarily make any but he become love, but it'll be clear what we need to do, what the next step is, what's right versus what's wrong for us. So that's kind of where I think that cycle is going. And I think we're going to get to the first big paradigm shift, which is this is a virtual reality. And science kind of agrees to that. Probably in the next, I don't know, let me just wag a guess out there, probably in the next 50 years or less. Because things move faster. It may be in the next 10 years or less. I don't know. But trying to be conservative and make it long enough that I think it probably would work, we say at least in the next 50. But that kind of depends. You know, if we have terrible things happen in the meantime, it may set us back centuries or millennia. I mean, it's hard to say. But right now, you know, present trends continue. Certainly in 50 years or less, I would think they would have figured all that out. What would you... Um what would you tell people who say, well, I need proof. Where is the proof of this? Yeah, I hear that a lot. People say, where's the proof? And mostly these are skeptics who don't really want proof. They're just trying to trap you in, the, yes. in, in, in you know, presenting them with proof. Well, when people ask for proof, you know immediately that they are not scientists. They don't understand science. And they really are more demagogues, you know, than anything else. Because science doesn't do proof. Science doesn't, nothing is proved. We gave that up back in the 1800s with Newton. We were so arrogant in the 1800s that Newton discovered some things and they were called laws because we were arrogant enough to think, that's it. We know the answer. It'll never change. This information will be, you know, perfect and true from now till eternity. We don't see that anymore. Back then we may have called Newton's laws proofs of force and other things, but we called them laws. But science doesn't go there anymore. Science doesn't prove anything at all. We can't prove anything at all. Proof is, is, a, is an illusion. You can't prove how old you are. You can't prove who your mother is. You can't prove you know, uh, I can't prove that this house we're sitting in is mine. You know, how can you prove any of these things? You say, well, we've got documents. We can prove it. Here's my birth certificate. See how old I am? Hey, doctors make mistakes like everybody else. How do we know that you weren't switched as a baby? You know, that's not your family. They're not your parents. Um, that you're that old? Maybe he wrote the time down wrong. Maybe somebody, just as a joke, you know, uh, changed the numbers. Or maybe, uh, 
somebody got in and uh, destroyed some documents and smeared the ink and couldn't read them and then kind of put in new ones to uh, cover up the error or the problem. Who knows what happens? There's no proof that you are any particular age. Now we can do a, we can look at your bones and look at the radiation and say plus or minus, you know, a thousand years, you know, we can radio date you, but uh, that's not proof either. That's just statistics, you see? So nothing can be proved. Lawyers don't prove their cases in court. They present evidence. And most of the evidence is circumstantial. And juries then come to conclusions looking at circumstantial evidence to what they believe. It's all about what you believe. It's all about evidence, not proof. Nothing gets proved. It's very hard. I mean, there are a few simple things. You can talk about proof, but we're talking anything complex, anything that's more than trivial is basically non-provable anyway. Now, evidence is something else, and we've got tons of evidence. People have been collecting evidence, say, just on things like telepathy or the paranormal or getting information that, you know, remote viewing. There's literally thousands and thousands of hours of people experimenting with remote viewing. The protocols are very tight. It's good science. We go back, what, 50, 60 years to, to uh, J.B. Ryan at Duke University. You know, lots of evidence. All sorts of researchers. Go read Dean Radin's books. There's lots and lots of evidence. Go look at uh, Targ and Putoff. Two scientists out of Stanford started doing uh, some work with remote viewing. Did some work with Yuri Geller. Good scientific protocol. Covered every possibility. And there's lots of paranormal stuff there. So there's tons of evidence. Matter of fact, their work was so good that it was published in a peer-reviewed IEEE journal, a communications journal, back in the late 60s. You see, we weren't as close-minded then as we are now. Uh, we've kind of gotten more close-minded in the last 50 years rather than less as far as our science go. That's because the science took over the job of the, of the head priests and once you become a priest, then you have a lot of energy invested in the status quo. You knowing what's right and what's wrong. You don't like to admit things that you really don't know. That's why we, you know, we don't really admit that a lot of our science is just, um, you know, unknown to us. What we do to each other, you know, the physicists talk about it to each other, but it's not kind of a public thing we're proud of. So we kind of keep that off to the side. It's just weird science. You wouldn't understand. I don't have to tell you that. Yeah, there's lots and lots of evidence. You know, so if that's what science is about, is about evidence. The only place you'll find people interested in proofs are in very button-down logical uh, processes such as logic. You do logical proofs. You see, a logical proof is bossy as a cow, all cows have wings, you know, therefore bossy has wings. Now that's a logic proof. And it's, it's a correct logic proof. It's got a very dubious assumption in it, all cows have wings, but that's just an assumption. The logic is true. You see, that's a logic proof. And mathematicians do proofs. But mathematicians just do logic. Mathematics is just the logic of quantity. So yes, you can do little proofs like that. And you can do, you know, and, and go to your, you know, go to college and take uh, logic, you know, as a subject, and you'll do proofs. So proof works there as a, as a real word. Other than that, the people who talk about proofs tend to be lawyers who want to appear that they've proved something when all they're really trying to do is manipulate a jury to agree with them. And we talk about um, whiskey is of a certain proof, right? Which uh, is just uh, a number two multiplied times the alcohol content. And demagogues, you know, skeptics are always into proof. Where's your proof? Do you have any proof? Well, people who are trying to manipulate an audience to think that something is bogus use the word proof a whole lot. But real honest people doing honest work and honest science, we don't do proof. We do evidence. 
And there's tons of evidence available for anybody who wants to get on their computer and, you know, look up evidence. I've just given you a few things to look at. You know, look at Dean Radin. Look at Put Off and Targ. You know, look at J.B. Ryan. You know, look at the Google remote viewing. You know, look at the, the people who are doing research in that. It's been done now for 40 years. You know, it's not like this is something discovered last week. That's why you don't know about it. It's been around a long time. So uh, the evidence is broad and wide and deep, and the protocols are good. Look at Pear Labs, okay, an offshoot of Princeton Engineering. Go to Pear Labs, Google P-E-A-R, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, Pear Labs. If you go there, you'll watch the little video up front where they talk about what they're doing. And they will tell you that in an ensemble of all the experiments they've done, the probability that their answers are wrong or just got there by accident, less than one in a billion. Nobody gets significance criteria like that. Science doesn't require that, you know. So the proof is good. The protocols are good. And we don't lack for evidence. So the idea of proof, can you prove it? Where's your proof? That shows you somebody who really isn't interested in the subject or they're confused and think that something like proof exists. It's, where's your evidence? Well, that's easy. Go Google Pear Labs. Look at their evidence. There's a bunch of PhD physicists out of Princeton and engineers doing very careful research. And that's all very careful <clears throat> work and immaculate protocol. But truly, evidence, would, would you say, is, is most important when it's applied to personal experience? Sure, sure. There's, there's the evidence that we do in groups, and that's what you get out of Pair Labs or, or, or Ryan's Institute. Um, that's, what you, uh, that's what Dean Radin is doing. You know, they're doing uh, uh, evidence that is objective, but we also have evidence that is subjective. That's our own personal evidence, experiences that you have. There's something like 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the populations who've had paranormal experiences of one type or another. Telepathically, they got information they had no way to know. Uh, they have precognitive dreams where they see some scenario happen that then actually happens. Contacted uh, and communicated with somebody who's been dead some time and get information that nobody could know but that person. And they check it out. Uh, Kids that, uh, you know, uh, are eight years old and, and uh, focused on flying airplanes, right? And turn out they can produce lots of detailed information specifying a, what they call a past life. You know, this is, these are all subjective evidence. But they're, a subjective evidence is mainly evidence for the person who experiences it. Now, there may be few people around them that realize that they're doing good work. You know, take the, take the kid, he's on, he's on YouTube, that uh, has divulged a lot of information about a past life, which checks out historically. That may be evidence for him, definitely, his parents, because they helped check it out. A few historians and other people that did the research to check out the information. So there's a small group of kind of insiders to that process that consider that evidence even though it's, it's not objective. Okay? It's a subjective experience of his, but it creates objective evidence for those people. But now all the other people who don't really relate to that personally, they weren't part of that. They didn't talk to him. They didn't do the research. Oh, that's a bunch of stuff. You know? It's not evidence to them because it's not theirs. You have to go gather your own evidence. If it's not your experience, it's not your truth. It needs to be your truth. You need to have your experience. And it's not that hard to get. Anybody with three or four months, six months at the longest, with a real concerted effort to gather their own subjective experience of a larger reality can do it. It's not that hard. These things uh, like healing with your mind, uh, remote viewing, these are things that are easy to do. Anybody can do them. But you have to get rid of the ego. 
get rid of the beliefs, get rid of the fear, and then they become easy things to do. And with practice, you'll get better at them. But hey, you only need to do it once to provide evidence. You see, if one time you can read the message in an envelope that was randomly picked out of a thousand envelopes with messages in them and somebody, oh, here's, here's envelope number 625, what's the message in it? And you can read it. If you only do that once, that's evidence that it's possible. If you fail to do it another hundred times, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to do. You've already shown that it's possible to do just by doing it once shows the possibility, you see. We have, what we do is that we, we study these things and what we've done is we have shown, we've produced lots of evidence that paranormal information does exist. People do get it. There have been people with precognitive dreams. There have been people who have received telepathic messages. There are people who have read messages in sealed envelopes and so on. So the researchers know all that. There are people who use their intent to modify statistical distributions. We know that. But that just tells you that it's a fact, that it's true, that these things are real. That's all it tells you. It doesn't really give you any insight, any personal information. You have to have your own experience for that. Otherwise, it's just kind of out there, but it's not something you can process at a, at a deep level. We can perhaps conclude then, conclude our discussion on these steps as human beings to lower our entropy that the most important uh, would be to start with yourself and gather yes. your own experience. The only person you can change is yourself. The only experience that can inform you or educate you is your own. So the way that you change the world or change your nation or change your marriage or change any of your relationships is to change yourself. So it's not that, you know, it's those people out there that are screwing it up for the rest of us. We need to change them. That's the wrong approach. Those people out there screwing it up for the rest of us are just like the rest of us. They're not a lot different than the rest of us. And you can best change the whole, change those people by changing yourself. You become then a good example of right living, of, of uh, right attitude, of love, of caring. And that shines a light all around you and that affects other people. And it spreads. So you change yourself and that's really the best thing you can do. If you want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, change yourself. If you just shake your fist and holler and swear at the people that you think are messing it up, you're part of the problem. You're still part of the problem. It's still about you. It's still, you know, it's not, uh, it's not productive. So just fix yourself. Get rid of your own ego. Get rid of your own expectations. Get rid of your beliefs. Get rid of your fear. And if you can do that, you will maximize your contribution to the whole. Thank you, Tom. This is, as always, very informative and very wise advice. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much, Donna. It's been fun, as always. Thank you. Yeah, we've been talking about uh, entities having to come together to cooperate, to act in kind of a, a group interest, if you will, as opposed to uh, just individual interest and how that leaves you with a bigger reality, a bigger decision space, and more freedom for the individual. You don't lose your individuality or your individualness in such a structure. You actually gain more. It's a, it uh, is not a, uh, you become a, a servant or a slave, you know, to the mob or to the whole. It doesn't work that way. The whole is in freeing. It sets you free. Well, this doesn't have to have to happen in one g giant big step. You don't have to go from a whole bunch of independent humans running around to suddenly all the humans loving each other in a place like Gaia. You see, we talked about that, but it, it probably isn't going to work in a great big sudden, you know, 
we all are we all fear each other then we all love each other the next day it doesn't work like that so you can expect that uh, it'll occur first in groupings there will be cultures perhaps or maybe nations or maybe areas within nations where that seems to work and because it works so well and is so productive you know it seems to spread you know that sort of thing in, in a very mild in a very mild way, we can see even in industry, where we started in an industry, you know, the, uh, the owners of industry were very abusive. You know, go back to the early, what, in the 1800s or something, when the Industrial Revolution just getting started, and we have these reports of children being chained to their machines so they couldn't run away and not come back, sort of thing. So they were fed and whatever, but they had to stay chained to their machines. Well, that's pretty extreme. But we obviously don't do that now, you see. Why? because it isn't good business. It doesn't work well. You can do much better if your employees enjoy coming to work. There are some companies I read about, I can't remember, it was a machine company somewhere in Ohio, and uh, I think all of their employees were owners of the company. And they had wonderful benefits because they divided up all the profits among themselves. So they had the incentive to do good work, to be innovative, to make profits because the more they made profits, the better they did, you see. So that company became like a leader in its area. Its products were very competitive and very good because the people really put their hearts and minds to producing those products. So you find out that if you, you know, if you have, you know, we found that out in the, you know, like at the, uh, after the Civil War, where we went from slave running the farm to sharecroppers running the farm, to hired farmhands, you know, running the farm, it kept getting better and better. When you actually gave people a reason to work, rather than, you know, whip them if they didn't, you got a lot more productivity from those people. They'd come up with solutions, how we could do this better. You know, things evolved. We got more innovation, which led to more machines, which led to bigger crops, you know, it all just works. The reason you get somebody sitting down and, and uh, inventing a, you know, what is it, uh, you know, harvesting machine, you know, what was the first one, the cotton gin, the reason somebody does that is because there's somebody working in a cotton field who has a better idea. There's somebody that's part of that team that says, you know, I bet a machine could, you know, could do that, and they talk to other people, and they cooperate, and you end up with innovation. It's not the guy who owns the bunch of slaves who comes up with a cotton gin, you see? So it's just the idea, you know, that is, that doesn't work as well. You might think, yeah, well, that's the best, slave labor. You don't pay them anything. They reproduce, give you more slaves, and that's really great. It's not. It's a very suboptimal way to do business. The reason our business have grown and get more and more profitable and produce better things with less is because we don't have slaves. It's because we pay people who can think and who are anxious to help out because the business success is their success. You see, you become a part of it. So that's, it's all part of the same thing. Another part is that there have been people all along, particularly back in the 1800s, 1700s, this was popular. They come up with these um, ideas of what would be the perfect way for social groups to interact with each other. They're called utopian schemes. And there have been lots of utopian schemes, and often a bunch of 30 or 40 people will go off and live that way, you know, and, and they always fall apart after a, a generation or so. After the initial leaders no longer tie it all together, it tends to dissolve and go away. But utopian schemes are basically what we, you know, what we live with every day. Um, capitalism is a utopian scheme. Adam Smith's invisible hand, you see, solves all the problems. That's, that's a utopian scheme. Uh, socialism was a utopian scheme. Communism, you know, was a utopian scheme. These are all political economic schemes that say that if you just do this, everybody will live happily ever after and it will be, it will be good for all of us, you know. Well, None of them work real well. 
You know, we've tried unfettered capitalism with no restraints, and what we got was pretty rough. We got the robber barons is what we got. We got wealth in the hands of a few who made the lives of the many miserable, and basically we had, a, we had abuse. That was back at the time with the children tied to the machines. You know, we got that sort of thing. Then we realized that some regulation was required. So now we have trust busting and, and we have other regulations that, that uh, prohibit abuse of people because the powerful can easily abuse the powerless. And that tends to devolve into something that isn't, isn't very productive. Again, the powerless, the slaves, aren't real productive. That's a, that's a very unproductive configuration. So we learned that capitalism had to be tamed with some things to make it more productive. And socialism didn't work out because this idea that, well, it's all about the people. We, the government, are only interested in the people, turned out to be phony. We, the government, are mainly interested in ourselves, our power, you know. And uh, the same with communism, the fact that the, you know, the government was only interested in the people. Communism was a remake of socialism. And uh, it didn't work any better because the government was interested in its own power, primarily. Well, what's wrong with all these utopian schemes? None of them seem to work. What's the difficulty here? Why doesn't Adam Smith's hand, invisible hand, fix everything? If you just let it and get rid of all the, you know, all of the um, regulation, wouldn't it be wonderful? Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Why not? because we are not populated by perfect people. If all the people in the system were love-based instead of fear-based, it would work wonderfully. The invisible hand would be a perfect way of doing it. Well, but if all the people in the system were love-based, socialism would work too, because the people in charge wouldn't be interested in just their power. They'd really be interested in the people. If you, you know, same thing with communism, same thing with all these other utopian schemes. Most of these utopian schemes would work just fine if they had perfect people. If you got rid of the fear, the jealousy, the greed, and all of that that destroys it. Adam Smith's invisible hand doesn't work well if the people are not knowledgeable, if the people are not focused on long-term strategies, Okay. In other words, the market will only write itself if you have intelligent consumers. The industry will only work with competition if they allow competition. If one industry goes out and basically what, you know, beats all the competition, and they don't have to beat them honestly, they can beat them by passing laws that inhibit the competitors. They can beat them by assassinating you know, the business leaders in a competitive business. They all kinds of underhanded and, and uh, wrong ways that they can end up winning in business by being more diabolical or, or maybe abusing their employees more or something else. And in a world where there are perfect people, none of that would take place. That wouldn't happen. But see, that does happen. So you end up with robber barons that are abusive. Now, they created a lot of infrastructure. We got railroads and electricity and a lot of things out of those robber barons. Not that they weren't productive, but it could have been done so much more efficiently had people worked together rather than with, you know, the powerful, you know, beating up the, the powerless. It's, it's unnecessary and it isn't effective. So what, what that says is that it really doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter whether you're starting with capitalism, with free love, with socialism, with communism, if you had a bunch of people, if all the people in your society were love-based, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. They'd all work initially, and none of them would stay what they are for very long. They would all just morph into something that was the most effective and suitable for those people. And as those people's wants and needs change, the former structure of their government and their economy would change because there wouldn't be an invested interest in, oh, I like this, this is good for me, we'll keep it that way. I like the power, so I'm going to make sure I stay that way because that's not love-based, that's fear-based. So anywhere you start, 
no matter what system you start with. Even if you started with fascism, if you had all the people that were love-based, the system would just naturally meld and change and grow until to become whatever was most effective and efficient for the whole. You see, so we have all these schemes and there's other schemes to replace the capitalism, socialism, communism, you know, there's, there's more isms on the way coming that we hear about. You can find them on the internet. And we look at the things that are wrong. Well, it's the money. It's the money system that's wrong. It's the Fed that's wrong. It's this. It's the greedy, you know, it's the greedy capitalists that are wrong. No, it's the socialist collective people who try to run everything that's wrong. And it's true. All those things are wrong. But the reason they're wrong isn't the system. They're wrong because the people in them are fear-based. And the people that run them are just like the people in them. The people that run them are a representative of the people that are in them. It's just fear-based. So the thing is, is that the right, most, most optimal economic and political systems will just take care of themselves. They will just evolve themselves to be whatever we need and change as our needs change. If we, the people, were not fear-based, you see? So again, how do you want to fix the political system? How do you want to fix the economic system? If what you want to do is rearrange, you know, the players, you want this system or that system, you want to get rid of the feds, you want to do this. Well, those things might help a little bit. They may civilize us a little bit more and get rid of some of our pain, but they're not really long-term solutions. They're short-term solutions. Something just as bad will evolve to take its place as long as the people are fear-based. You know, they have needs. They, have, they work out of their ego. They're greedy. They want more. The more they get, the more they want. As long as you have those kind of people, then you will get those kinds of systems. So the economic and political systems we have simply reflect us. They're there because the way we are. Those people that are in charge are just like the people who aren't in charge. They just happen to follow a different path and got to be in charge, you see. There's nothing that special about them. They're just like everybody else. So there's a lot of angst and anger about fixing the system. About how do you, you know, how do you make the system kinder and gentler? How do you make the system more fair? Say it's not fair. How do you make it more... Um, so we say merit-based rather than who you know based. How do you make it better? And well, we find all the bad things that we want to fix. But it's just like getting rid of the one dictator to replace him with the next. Nothing can be fixed in the long term until we fix ourselves. So if you, wanna, if you don't like the economic system you're in, if you don't like the politics that you know, runs your country, the best way to fix it is to grow yourself. Get rid of your ego, get rid of your expectations, get rid of your, your fear, and get rid of, of your uh, beliefs. Become love. And then all the rest, everything else, your economics, your politics, your male-female relationships, your, you know, your interactions with everything will take care of themselves. They'll all be just optimal and work fine. They'll become whatever they need to become. But as long as we are basically driven by ego and fear, this is what you get. And trying to fix it by fixing this and fixing that and changing the currency and doing other kinds of things, it's like rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. It's the same thing. All right, this is a nicer arrangement of the chairs. The Titanic's going into the water and everybody will drown. But look at the chairs. They're so much prettier in this arrangement, you see. It's like that. Yes, we have things that are fundamentally wrong in our politics and in our economic systems. And it might be nice to change some of those because, you know, a pretty arrangement of chairs is nicer. It's more aesthetic. And it may alleviate some pain, but it's not a long-term fix. It's an illusion to think that that then will be the utopian system. If we could just get rid of the Fed, if we could just change, you know, the way we're on a, 
on a scarcity based economy instead of you know instead of a um, abundance based economy you know here are these sorts of things we could just do that yes but the only way you do that is to get rid of the fear based population you see so that's kind of a, an interesting thing because you, you go on the internet and you have all this political and economic stuff and everybody wants to change something anything but themselves there's so much ego and fear out there there it's a difficult those i think are difficult things to change for anyone there's so much conditioning programming beliefs how would you start well like i say starting with changing what's out there is wrong headed at best that will get you a temporary solution that temporary solution will not last because if you don't change the quality of the people then the quality of the systems or the quality of the institutions that the people have aren't going to change either you might make it a little sweeter for a while you know when you get rid of that last nasty dictator and a whole new bunch come in for a while everybody's happy it's sweet and then eventually some strong man comes along and takes over and it's right back where it was so you may have a little sweet period where you get up some breathing room for that reason but as long as the people support a totalitarian government or have the fear based and the need based and the greed based values that support that kind of government then that's the kind of government you're going to get so it's the same thing so how do you go about it the only the thing you you go about doing is changing yourself getting rid of your fear getting rid of your beliefs those are the problems you can't change anybody else's beliefs how would you approach that though how uh, would you getting rid of your fear uh, but you don't even you have some beliefs you have said that you don't even know you have and getting rid you, of your fear and you, your ego yes you have lots Hard of to identify. you have lots of fears you don't know you have many probably most of your beliefs are generated by your fears your fear is your most basic driving thing most of your beliefs are driven by your fears but not all there are some beliefs that aren't some beliefs you just get by existing in a culture cultural beliefs just soak into you by osmosis because everybody around you believes them and you do too kind of a group mind thing if you will you're influenced by the thoughts of others So those aren't necessarily generated by your fear, but they're probably generated by the group fear of the culture. Anyhow, how do you go about it? Well, fear tends to be hidden from you. That's the ego's job. The ego's job is to keep you from having to deal with the fear. So start with the ego. Because the ego sticks right out like a sore thumb. The ego is easy to find. This is how easy it is to find ego. If you ever have a feeling, an emotion that is not joy and not happy, if you feel anger, if you feel upset, if you feel uh infuriated, if you feel, you know, going on and on, if you feel slighted, if you feel not appreciated, and all the list if you can think of everything that isn't joy and happiness. all those things that you feel that are negative or downers all of those are attached to a fear because without the fear you wouldn't feel that way so when you feel anger or something upsets you or something annoys you say well why do i feel that way where does that come from what's the root of that somebody said something and i get angry oh damn that's stupid that's the problem with the world people like that well that comes from a fear take that fear back and say where does that come from what am i afraid of and you'll get back to some root fear that you have well i'm afraid of that you know these that i'm going to be hurt in this mess that these people are making uh, you know it's about you well why are you afraid of being hurt by this mess these people are making well you know and you'll find out you just keep working back and you'll get to the root fear that actually is causing that discomfort when you get there there's no easy way just to dispel it you can't say all right fear now that i've seen you disappear sometimes that works but mostly it doesn't mostly it's not an intellectual thing the fear wasn't put there intellectually it can't be taken away intellectually 
The only antidote for fear is courage. And courage, and I guess uh, you need to have gumption to, to deal with it. You need to want to really get rid of it. If you really want to get rid of it, then you will, you will notice that fear. And you say, okay, whenever I feel this way, whenever I get this, I'll know that it's that fear because now I understand that connection. And as soon as you feel yourself doing it, you say, uh, I'm not going there. That's fear talking. And you don't go there. And if you do that often enough, you won't even have to say, uh, and catch it. You'll just stop doing it because it won't make any sense to you. And that is overcoming the fear. So you have to really want to overcome it and you have to have the courage to overcome it because a lot of our fears are there because we really don't have the courage to deal with things we need to deal with. So you need to have the courage to deal what you have to deal with. So that's how we do it. That's the biggest thing. We have a lot of beliefs that we don't know. Most of them are cultural. Some of them are species. You know, we believe all kinds of things that, that we never, nobody sat down and told us, now here's the way it is. You see, reality is physical. There is nothing in this reality but physical, and our universe is all there is. Nobody does that, but almost all of us believe that because that's what our culture believes. You see, almost all the scientists believe it because that's what their culture believes. But that's kind of a standard Western cultural belief that a large majority of the culture kind of believes that way, thinks that way. They never think anything about it. They never even think to question it. They don't have any interest in questioning it. It's just there. It's the way it is. You see, it's one of those things that are so accepted that uh, they're invisible. So we have a lot of these invisible beliefs that we don't know about. Like we believe that if you don't move, you can't go anywhere. You know, if I don't get up and move to get to there, then I can't get to there. Well, that's a belief. It's a belief because in this physical reality, that's the way it is. In the, real, in the larger reality, that's not the way it is at all. But we get into the larger reality and we still have this need to travel to go somewhere. That's why people having near-death experiences go through tunnels. It's not because the larger reality is full of tunnels with lights at the end. It's because in order to get somewhere else, they have to move. And the way you perceive motion is that there's a changing background, you know, because you then interpret that as you're moving and the background sitting still. So you make a tunnel and then you move through the tunnel. Well, the only reason you have to move through a tunnel to get there is because you have this belief that you can't get somewhere if you don't move. So it's a belief that we have here that's true here in this physical virtual reality, but it's not true everywhere. We believe it has to be true everywhere. That's the belief, that it's universal, you see. And there's lots of beliefs like that, where we believe things that are universal just because they're here in this virtual reality. There's much in this virtual reality that is just local and not universal. So first, anything that upsets you or aggravates you, where you have a negative emotional experience that's not joy or happiness, find the fear. Once you see the fear, don't let that fear push you into that kind of feeling anymore. You see, then you start taking responsibility for who you are. People say, so-and-so sure makes me angry. Nobody can make you angry but you. You choose to be angry. Why do you choose to be angry? Because you have fear. That's why you choose to be angry. It's ego. Ego is a derivative of fear. No fear, no ego. Because you have fear, you have ego. How do you go about changing it? You just have to want to change it. You have to find the fear. Then you have to have the strong enough drive to beat that fear by just not letting it drive you. Not letting so-and-so, you know, again, makes you angry. So-and-so is messing up the world, you know. We need to change that. We need to, you know, get rid of them. Get rid of all those people that are doing that. Well, in the short run, that's good. And everybody should vote, no doubt. I always vote. I want to get rid of the scoundrels that I don't like. Actually, it turns in more of, you know, I vote for the person that is least likely to make the biggest mess. You know, it's that sort of thing. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
Sure, you should do all those things because that's the way this world works. But you're not going to make dramatic changes in your world and in your level of joy and happiness until you change yourself, till you stop blaming others, blaming the economy, blaming the, you know, the politics, blaming your neighbors, blaming your spouse, blaming your dog. You know, we blame everything and everybody but us. And we are the only one that's responsible for all that. To get angry is our choice. And we choose it because we have fear. We choose it because we have expectations. Expectations are derivatives of belief. We have an expectation, it's not met, <clears throat> we're upset. It's because of that expectation. Like I said, that's just a belief. And most of those beliefs come from fears. So find it, refuse to let it push you around like that. Refuse to let that, that fear, that, that expectation make you angry. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. And you will take your life back. Basically, instead of being driven and pushed this way and that way by your fears and your beliefs, you'll actually be in charge of yourself. You'll actually be responsible for yourself. You know, that's a, that's a, a question I got uh, uh, with uh, uh, Lori, uh, Lori Houston. She, she said, so many people feel like they're being pushed and pulled by their unconscious mind. Because they think, I'm not really that mean person, but boy, I sure did snap and get angry there. It's my unconscious, I'm, I'm pushed around by this unconscious mind that uh, makes me do this and makes me do that. Nothing makes you do anything. You choose to do all those things. Take responsibility. It's not your subconscious that's forcing you to do things. You have that subconscious because you're fearful. It's your fear and beliefs that create the subconscious. The subconscious is the, is the underneath the rug. You sweep all the stuff under the rug to get it out of you, your fears. You want to bury those fears so you don't deal with them. You sweep them under the rug. Your unconscious mind, your subconscious, is just what's under the rug. That's why it's sub. It's under the rug. And that's why you don't think it's there. Of course, it still stinks, even though it's under the rug. It pushes you around. And a lot of us are, are pushed throughout our life, pushed and pulled by this fear and these beliefs we have. That makes our life unhappy, makes us miserable. We're angry. We get ulcers in our stomach, all the angst, all the stress that we have because all the stress, things aren't going the way I want them to. Well, that's again, it's fear-based. Where's that fear come from? That things have to be the way you want them to. Why do you feel that way? Where's that coming from? Well, it's because I'm afraid that I won't get mine and I won't get enough and I won't have enough to do what I want to do. Well, that's all about I, me, mine. That's all ego stuff. If you let that go, you'll find you get what you need. I think that was a, a uh, song, wasn't it? <laughs> if you just try, you'll get what you need. And that's true. What you need comes to you. You don't have to force it out of reality. Just be love and it'll come. Everything you need will, will happen. Your relationships will get better. You'll be happier. So it's the same sort of thing, you know, the same place that we've been. The only reason you have a subconscious mind is because you have fear and you have beliefs. You get rid of your fear and beliefs, you don't have a subconscious mind. Nothing pushes and pulls you. You're not driven to do things. You're not driven to feel this way or that way. You're responsible for all your own feelings and all your own choices. And you actually get to make those choices. See, right now, you're not even making a lot of the choices you could make because you're driven by your fear to jump at this and jump at that. They're not considered responsible choices. You don't own yourself. Your fear owns you. Your beliefs own you. They make you feel. They make you believe. They make you do all kinds of things. So here you are like a monkey on a string. You're a puppet dancing this dance and that dance because of all this fear and belief that you have. you got to take yourself back. Become responsible for you and your choices. And when you do that, life gets good. Life gets sweet. Things work out really, really well. But people are afraid to do that. They're afraid. They say, if I don't keep manipulating that outside world to be the way I want it, I'll get run over. I'll get crushed. 
The only reason that I'm alive now and surviving is that I manipulate, I structure that world, I make things happen the way I want them. I force them to come out my way. That's an illusion. You think so. You're out there doing all this manipulation and stuff and you think that's making it come your way. All it's doing, all you're really doing is shooting yourself in the foot. You're just making more and more problems for yourself. You don't know it. So here's this, this idea. If you want to sum up what we're here, what our job is here in this reality, I'd sum it up as this little phrase, stuff happens and we get to deal with it. That's it. That's all the life. That's why we're here. Stuff happens and we have to deal with it. Well, we focus all of our energy on the front end. Stuff happens. And we spend all of our time trying to manipulate the stuff happening to be the way we want. Our relationships, our work, our boss, our friends, our neighbors. We want, we want that to be how we want. If we don't like our neighbors, we'll build a fence. Shut them out. You know, we want to manipulate it to be the way we want. And all of our focus is there on the front end to make that stuff happen the way we want. The back end is really where all the action is. That's where really where life is played out is on the back end. Deal with it. Deal with it means you have to make choices. If you make choices that are good choices, you grow. You become love. You get rid of fear. You get rid of beliefs. These are good choices. You lower your entropy. You evolve the quality of your consciousness. The, the important thing here in this stuff happens and you get to deal with it is how you deal with it, not what happens. And when you deal with it well, when you deal with it without fear and ego, guess what? The stuff that happens is sweet. The stuff that happens is good. It still may be challenging, but it's good. It's a challenge that you enjoy. It's a challenge you like to meet. Struggle with the front end. Life is hard. Life, every time I think I got it under control, <clears throat> I get bitten again. Every time I get everything in the suitcase, another thing, you know, a sleeve pops out somewhere else. It's like it's just impossible to contain. I thought when I got this worked out in my relationship, my relationship would really be great after that. It isn't. Got that thing worked out. Now it's something else. It'll always be something else. You're creating that because you're focused on the front end of, of our life here. Stuff happens. And you're neglecting the, you know, what choices do I make about it? How do I deal with it? Deal with it with love. The front end will take care of itself. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be stupid and that you can't care about what happens. You still have to care about what happens. You still need to get a job so you can pay your mortgage. You still need to get your children to school on time. You still need to do things and you need to plan for those things. So I'm not saying that, that uh, you should just ignore the world and expect when you need money it'll appear in your pocket you still have to you know go out in the world and do things but you do it on that love based not on the fear based and not on the belief based and when you do what happens is easy it works out it works out well that's in a nutshell what do we do about it? We stop focusing on the front end of that. We start focusing on the back end of that. We start changing ourselves. We stop worrying about trying to change other people, make our spouse the way we want to, make our government and everything the way we want to. Sure, vote. Sure, go out and demonstrate. Sure, let people know. Join political committees. You know, Act, interact. That's what you should be doing. But do it out of love and caring, not out of anger. If you're doing it out of anger... You're just one more part of the problem. And if all you angry people get your way, you'll get something that's just as bad as what you replaced because you're going at it from the wrong direction, you see? So that's kind of the summarize it all up into a nutshell. I think that's very valuable. I think that's going to be very valuable. And something we might be able to do is to start off slowly, maybe with small things, choose better food, choose to be a little bit kinder, start with those things and and build that up to yeah. uh, more and more just better choices. Right. Look at those negative feelings that you get. Go find the fear. Deal with that fear. Don't just run away from it. Deal with it and say, I'm, I'm going to get rid of that fear. Next time that happens and I feel that anger, I'm going to stop that anger before I execute that. Before I say something rude, I'm going to stop and say, no, wrong reason. 
Don't go there. And eventually it'll go away. That fear will, will dissipate and go away. You can beat it. You just have to want to and take the time and effort to, to do it. I think that's very good. There's so much stress in the world and stress causes so many problems oh, that yes. uh, I find that uh, I have tried that and uh, it does work and you let go of more and more things. So it is very valuable. Yeah. When you feel a lot of stress, that tells you there's a problem. Mm. You know, And the problem isn't the thing that you think is causing the stress. The problem is how you are choosing to act about that thing that creates the stress. So we need to stop blaming the outside world mm -hmm. for our problems. We need to start being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And we do that by changing the only thing we can change, which is us.